You will hear a telephone conversation between an employee of an airline company and a customer. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. GB Airlines, uh, this is Kyle speaking. How can I help? Hi, my name is Matt Walsh. I'm calling on behalf of Mr. John Sparrow to claim expenses for a delay in his flight last week. Good morning, Mr. Walsh. Uh, thank you for calling. Could you please tell me the flight number and the date of departure? The date of departure was the 24th of January, 2016. I'm afraid I don't have the flight number in front of me at the moment. OK, that's all right. One moment. Uh, could you tell me where was Mr. Sparrow departing from? He was departing from Athens. Uh, is that Athens, Greece or Athens, Georgia? Athens, Greece. Right. And what was the destination? It was Heathrow, London. Right. We've got two flights from Athens to London, Heathrow, on the 24th of January 2016. Was it the 3.25 p.m. flight or the 9.45 p.m.? It was the later one, 945. OK, so the flight number is GB1011. Right, OK. OK, yes. I can see that Mr Sparrow's flight was cancelled and he was booked on the next flight on the 25th of January at 3.25pm. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. According to our system, one of my colleagues spoke with Mr Sparrow on the phone on the 24th to inform him of the cancellation and offered to book a hotel for him for the night, but Mr Sparrow preferred to book one himself. Yes, because he didn't want to stay near the airport, as the next flight was in the afternoon. Yes, of course. Uh, could you tell me which hotel he stayed at? Yes, he stayed at the Hypnos Hotel. Oh, uh, could you spell that for me? Of course. That's H-Y-P-N-O-S. Right. Uh, thank you for that. And could you please tell me how much the total cost was for the night? Sure. It was 73 euros. Right. Uh, do you have a copy of the receipt for that? Yes, of course. Would you like me to send it to you? Uh, yes, please. Can I email a picture of it to you? Absolutely. Uh, the email address is refunds at gbairlines.co.uk. Great, thank you. No problem. Uh, were there any other expenses you wish to claim? Actually, yes. There was also the taxi ride to the airport and the taxi ride back the next day. Right. And what was the total cost? Um, the first taxi ride was 53 euros and the second one was 42. So 63, 73, 83. Yeah, so the total was 95 euros. I'll send you the receipt for those as well. Thank you. Uh, are there any other expenses? No, I think that's it. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Excellent. So if you could please send us the receipts for the hotel and the taxi rides, and after we receive them it should take about 48 hours for the funds to reach Mr Sparrow's account. Perfect. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, yes. There's one more thing. Um, Mr Sparrow complained about the meal during the flight. He said that it was a bit bland. Right. So he asked me if it was possible to switch to a different meal option for his upcoming flight to Kiev next week. Right, of course. Uh, just give me a minute, please. Right, I see that Mr Sparrow had the light meal option for his flight to London, and you would like to change that. Uh, what would you like to change it to? What are the other options? We've got 12 different meal options. Uh, would you like me to list all of them for you? Well, Mr Sparrow has told me that he would prefer something without meat. How many of these do not contain meat? 
we've got three meal options without meat. Uh, we've got the vegetarian option, the vegan option, and the Asian vegetarian. What's the difference? There's a variety of different dishes served with each option. Uh, for example, next week, the vegetarian option will be a small spinach and feta cheese pie, a bread roll, a salad, and tropical fruit. And the vegan option? The vegan option doesn't include any dairy products, and it also doesn't include fowl, eggs, or honey. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the specific menu for this week, but I can email it to you as soon as it becomes available. Oh, could you do that? That would be great. Yes, of course. Uh, I can email you a detailed description of all the meal options if you like. Yes, please. No problem. Uh, please do not forget to call us back to change the meal option. Uh, you need to do that 48 hours before the departure time for international flights and 24 hours for domestic flights. So 48 hours for this one then? Yes, exactly. Perfect. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, transatlantic flights require 48 hours. All flights within Europe require 24 hours. So in this case, you will need to call us 24 hours in advance. Um, I apologize for that. Okay, great. So could I please have your email address so I can send you the menus? Certainly. It's matt.walsh at sparrowlimited.com. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear part of a free class about safety around campus. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening. I'm Geoffrey Miller from the University of Nottingham Student Union. And in this week's free class, Carlos Garcia is going to tell us about safety around campus. Over to you, Carlos. Thank you, Geoffrey, and thank you all for your attendance today. Also, I'd like to thank the Student Union here at the University for organising this lecture. Well, I've been serving and protecting the City of Nottingham for over 20 years now as a member of the Police Department. Does anyone know what type of crime is the most prevalent on campus? I heard someone say drugs and alcohol. That actually isn't too much of an issue. Violence? Nope. Actually, the biggest thing we worry about here is theft. The nature of crime on Nottingham's campus is quite different from that of the surrounding areas. Crime rates across the East Midlands are very difficult to control. We'd like to see the rates stay the same for this calendar year, but it has been increasing steadily over the past three years. On campus, however, I'm happy to say that the overall crime rate has fallen this year. You wouldn't think so if you've seen the extremely exaggerated stories in the media. The media has done nothing but cause more concern about crime in our area. Even the crime shows you see today are a little bit far-fetched, but at least viewers know they're not real events. We'd really like to see more factual news articles out there so the public can have a rational sense of the safety level of our society. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, let's move on to what to do when you see a crime. Do not get involved, if at all possible, and do not draw too much attention to yourself by running away in a conspicuous manner. Though most likely, and hopefully, you will not have to experience this situation, if you are being mugged, please do not try to resist. Instead, be compliant and seek help after the incident. Like I said, though, it is highly unlikely that you will find yourself amidst a crime, but it is important to be prepared should it ever happen. We find that educating students and staff on the correct precautions to take is the best way to increase your safety. Just remember to be smart when you're out late at night and avoid any area or person that looks suspicious. I know it sounds obvious, but I cannot stress this enough. It's also not a bad idea to have your mobile phone with you at all times, but be careful. If you're chatting on your smartphone on your way home, you're a prime target for thieves. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people have left work or the library after 10 p.m. to go home before? A lot of you, right? If you do have to go home late at night, please don't walk home alone. More often than not, there's someone there that will be walking the same direction as you at some point. Walk home with a friend or co-worker, even if you must use your phone to call someone that's nearby to walk with you. It's always safer to walk home with someone. So when you're walking home, you may feel more comfortable with some sort of self-defense, such as pepper spray. Now, it's your call whether you want to carry something like this or not. However, I absolutely advise against carrying a knife or any other offensive weapon. All too often, they can be used against you if you're disarmed, putting yourself in more danger. For all those interested, the Recreation Centre offers a free self-defence class to all students every Thursday evening. While obviously an introductory self-defence class may not equip you to fight off villains like a regular superhero, it does come in handy sometimes. After taking a self-defence class, you'll surely be more aware of possible dangers and how to deal with them. So hopefully now you have a more complete understanding of the nature of crimes committed on your campus and how to avoid being a victim. I know most students at the University of Nottingham are not the criminal types, but remember that there is no barrier like a wall or something keeping non-students out. There's no army force securing the borders and I doubt anyone wants it that way. The campus is generally a safe place, but it's not immune to small crimes once in a while. All right, that's all I have to say for today. Stay safe. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt, 
Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph, and identify the plant species in ten one-square-meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than ten meters apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one-meter square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've we've already done that. I know. I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind, I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. OK, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. OK, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, uh, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mm, I agree. So what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See, this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. Well... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an introduction about an eco-friendly building called the Gherkin. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, I'd like to tell you about how UK architects are playing their part to address the issue of global warming. You have seen many of these iconic buildings while going about your everyday life, but you may not know how they are affecting your tomorrow. In 2003, Construction was completed on the famous Swiss rebuilding, or more informally called the Gherkin, a true masterpiece commissioned by the law offices of Foster and Partners. This is not the first ambitious endeavour of the firm. They are renowned for their various philanthropic environmental efforts. The Gherkin, with its cutting edge green initiative and sharp design, is gaining recognition as an icon in modern architecture. You can pick it out of the London skyline by its unorthodox cigar shape. While its appearance is the obvious attribute at which to marvel, there is far more to this building than meets the eye. And let's face it, there's a lot about this building that meets the eye. The building helps reduce the city's carbon footprint in a number of ways. Just a quick note, in case you're not familiar with the term carbon footprint, get used to it. It's a buzzword you'll hear relentlessly to talk about reducing emissions. Think of it as the amount of harmful greenhouse gases that are given off into the environment by a single person, organization or product. So going back to the Gherkin building, perhaps the most obvious as well as the most significant eco-friendly feature is the glass windows, which allow light to pass through the building, both reducing heating costs and brightening up the workspace. The ingenuity behind the various eco-friendly aspects of the Gherkin has seen its fair share of publicity both from serious and silly sources. In a recent April Fool's Day edition, one e-publication printed a story detailing plans to replace 50% of the current exterior with grass, which would not only make large steps in the name of sustainability, but also give the building the green hue that would truly earn it the nickname of the Gherkin. The only drawback is, as you may have guessed, that this story was an April Fool's Day joke and completely made up. In all seriousness though, the building is setting a new standard of design that other architects and city planners just cannot ignore. The building's bold and cost-efficient design has won a number of architecture awards, including the Stirling Prize, the London Region Award, and the Empress Skyscraper Award, among others. The design comfortably accommodates a large number of offices, while keeping maintenance and operation costs down, striking a superb balance between nature and the workplace. Nature is well and good, as long as the weather is nice outside. Given London's notoriously bad weather, the architects knew they must devise a quality temperature regulation system, and that they did. A special system designed to reduce the building's reliance on air conditioning was devised that cuts consumption in half compared to standard office buildings. There are atria that link each floor vertically to one another, forming spiraling spaces of the entire building. They serve not just as social common spaces, 
but also act as the building's lungs, distributing clean air from the opening panels in the facade through the entire building. The building isn't all business though. It has its fair share of fun as well. At the very top, a club room offers a picturesque entertainment spot for company functions, private parties, etc., with a breathtaking panoramic view of the city. The creation of such an innovative structure has many wondering what the future of urban planning and architecture may be. Well, if the other projects currently commissioned by Foster and Partners are any indication, the entire city constructed with similarly eco-friendly buildings is not far in the distance. The Mazda City development aims to create a desert city that produces zero waste and removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it puts in. A huge feat in protecting our Earth. The Gherkin is a truly impressive feat, yet it is not the only one worth noting. Now to move on to another green initiative, I'll tell you about the Eden Foundation building found in Cornwall. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.